Do a Die Hard. Sneak around, use air vents. You've never seen Die Hard? I'm 17, no, I've never seen Die Hard. Well, neither did the guy in Die Hard, so you're nailing it. Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. This will be my full Rick and Morty Season 6 Episode 2 video. There were a whole bunch of Easter eggs and references, so we'll break it all down. If you're brand new to the channel, I'm doing videos for all the episodes. Be sure to subscribe to get them. Careful for spoilers for the episode. If you haven't seen it yet, we'll start at the beginning and work our way through shot by shot, talking about Easter eggs and WTF moments as we go along, starting with the episode title, Rick, a mort well lived, which is a reference to the Buddhist phrase, a life well lived. Now, people have heard that phrase a lot all over the place. It was originally from the Buddha's Metta Sutta, a teaching on treating all beings with kindness and care, which is basically the theme of the episode. Where all the Mortys in this Roy game just want to live their lives out in peace, even though on a meta level, they're all fractured pieces of our Morty's one consciousness, and that's why everyone speaks with Morty's voice, except for Rick, who's playing as the Roy character. With Marta Morty, the main Morty, ending the episode by staying in the game to live out her life the way that she wanted to. Pay off the title, have a life well lived, but inside the game. That was the secret bargain she made with Rick at the end in exchange for getting all the rest of the Mortys, like all 5 billion plus of them, to leave the game. He had to agree to keep the Roy game running long enough for her to finish living out the rest of her life, which is why in the post credit scene, the workers at Blips and Chits wheel the game with its own power supply to make sure that it stays on into the very Indiana Jones looking warehouse that's full of massive piles of stuff. You can let me know if you spotted any other particular Easter eggs in the background here. Like, it seems like there's a Meeseeks box, but I couldn't spot any specific Easter eggs besides that. After which they joke about remembering where they put it because everything in the cavernous warehouse is digitally cataloged and backed up, so it doesn't really matter where they put anything. They'll be able to find it no matter what. A joke about the military in the Indiana Jones movies, like, how do you find anything in this warehouse? They're all in the same looking boxes. The cold open of the episode is the reveal that they're stuck inside the Roy game at Blips and Chips with everyone on the planet containing a piece of Morty's consciousness because the game frizzed out when the terrorists attacked. In a special cameo scene by Peter Dinklage of Game of Thrones Tyrion fame, I literally just did a House of the Dragon episode video where I talk a little bit about Tyrion, but I didn't know that he was going to cameo in this Rick and Morty episode, so that's a bit of a coincidence. And the whole exterior part of the episode in Blips and Chips, like the B storyline, is a parody of the Die Hard movie with both Peter Dinklage's group and Summer separately trying to pull a Die Hard, do the plot of the movie, without each other knowing about it till they're both fighting each other. Like, are you doing a Die Hard? Maybe. Are you doing a Die Hard? Maybe. Are you doing a Die Hard? Maybe. Are you also? Basically do all the things that John McClane and the villains did in that movie separately. And based on the logic in the episode, this is canon now to the Rick and Morty multiverse, all these realities. Once every culture reaches a point in the multiverse of Rick and Morty, they produce their own version of the Die Hard story in their mythology. And that's how these aliens knew about the plot of Die Hard and were pulling a Die Hard, because he's also written several books on it which they reference in one of his books that Summer winds up reading on the can called The Nakatomi Paradigm. That's a reference to the Nakatomi Plaza Tower from the movie that it takes place in, which Summer uses to learn the ending of the movie and how to take the gun to her back and win the scenario. In some cultures, it's called Tower Man. Rick reveals he also knows about that because he makes a reference to Tower Man at the end of the episode. Another culture calls it the Thornburg Cycle. That's a reference to the Richard Thornburg character in the Die Hard movie. Like, in one of the cultures, he's like the main character of their Die Hard mythology. Another culture in the multiverse calls it foolish to have imagined you'd be able to kill, which is a reference to a particular line of dialogue from the actual movie. And one of the funnier reveals is that at the end of the episode, after they both make it out of the game, they reveal that this is not Rick's first Die Hard. Like, he makes a reference to it at the beginning of the episode, telling Summer to go do a Die Hard, but he himself has already been through similar scenarios like this in other cultures. Because when Peter Dinklage's alien sees him, he recognizes him as Dr. Oz Elysium, like Rick has become a legend in his culture's Die Hard mythos. The other joke is that they do the whole plot of Die Hard as a tongue-in-cheek version of like a Cliff's Notes version. Like if you asked a child who had never seen Die Hard to explain the plot, that's basically what they did in the episode. Which is also a bit of a meta reference to the actual Rick and Morty TV show because it was originally inspired by Back to the Future. It was called Doc and Marty. So it's like Summer in the episode is pulling a version of the Doc and Marty version of Back to the Future. Like when she runs around in the episode killing all the aliens using Die Hard as an actual catchphrase, just repeating the line. That's also meant to be a reference to John McClane's yippee ki catchphrase. 
as they reveal what's going on with all the Mortys in the game, over the course of the episode, all the different Mortys, well, the people start to eventually shave their heads, wear Morty clothes, so that even though they all have very different bodies and faces, some are women, some are old men, they all slowly start to look more like Morty. Dan Harmon in the writer of the episode said this is also where they started to parody the organized religion and cults aspect of the episode. Like the Mortys in the game slowly start to turn it into a cult. We're all part of this larger, greater cosmic force that also just happens to be a 14 year old boy and we're all just video game characters. Which is why the main Morty, Marta, says her video game parents don't actually know anything about Judaism because they're just versions of Morty and Morty never learned anything about being Jewish. They also make a joke about that with a news broadcast later, it's called Good Enough News, which is why when he's trying to report the news, he does a really bad job of it. Rick also makes a lot of jokes throughout the episode about how all the crazy things that all the different Mortys get up to are going to be even funnier in the end because really it's just Morty doing bad things to himself. Ha! You'll know how funny that is when we get back. Some of the Mortys know the truth and don't want to leave, like the President of the United States. The reason why this isn't the Keith David looking version of the President, even though he'd have Morty's consciousness, is because when they visit the President, 50 years has gone by in the game, so the original Keith David version of the President would have already served out his terms a long time ago. They do make a lot of real world political jokes too when he talks about a bunch of people being united under a big bag of dicks. The reason why they say that Morty was fractured into a little over 5 billion people instead of like the 8 billion that should normally be on Earth, like if it was a version of Earth, there'd be a little over 8 billion people alive. I think either what happened is that there's only a little over 5 billion people on this planet, or what happened is they're just saying that there are a little over 5 billion people who have brains that are capable of housing a portion of Morty's consciousness. When Rick comments to the other Mortys about losing followers every time he has to explain the truth to them, that's just a joke about how some of the Mortys don't want to believe the lie, like they want to actually be part of this cult. He also makes a Get Swifty episode reference when he says he's an old school hip hop man. His joke about missing the mark on diversity is because most of the Mortys here are white and because he represents most of the people on the planet, you should see like a much wider variety of Mortys here. Also, there's the idea that they're all starting to resemble Morty, like they're making themselves look more like Morty does in real life, so everybody looking the same would be like the opposite of diversity. When Rick tries to tell the military Morty that there's no God, even in the real world, that's actually a reference all the way to the pilot episode. Oh my God, my parents are so loud, I wanna die. Mm, there is no God, Summer. Gotta rip that band-aid off now, you'll thank me later. Within the Rick and Morty multiverse, there are higher level cosmic beings that he's gone up against, but no actual one true God. Even the version of Jesus they did on the show was like a fictional version within the context of this one particular scenario, so it wasn't meant to be a real version. Even though the real devil is canon to Rick and Morty, that doesn't prove that God exists by association. I think until Rick acknowledges that God exists on the show, he doesn't exist on the show, so to speak. We'll see if he finally bends in that direction by like season 10 or season 100, however many seasons Rick and Morty winds up going. 100 years, Rick and Morty, then we'll finally prove God's existence. You notice once Marta talks him down and he realizes the truth, he starts talking like Morty. They all start talking like Morty, saying oh geez over and over again. Oh geez, come here. Oh geez, come here. Oh, geez. Oh, geez. Also, his character had a very loose understanding of his backstory in a war because Morty in real life doesn't really know that much about world history. Like he doesn't do that well in school. That's why he calls it a generic overseas war. Back in Blitz and Chips, one of the aliens is named Winslow, which is a reference to Reginald Vell Johnson's Die Hard character, who's actually mostly known for playing Carl Winslow on Family Matters. When they're doing the montage around the world to all the different Mortys and different cultures, I love that a bunch of awakened Mortys who know the truth are now going to see peep shows together. Also, Morty is such a big horn dog that a bunch of these Mortys are just willing to get it on with each other knowing the truth, like they're just getting it on with themselves technically, but they don't care. Then he sort of explains the logic of the scenario, like what happens with Morty losing pieces of his consciousness, which they pay off at the end of the episode. Because every time in the game, one of the people dies, a piece of Morty's consciousness dies, like a fraction dies, and eventually those fractions add up. By the end of the episode, Marta is the only person who stays in the game. So it's like that one little piece of Morty that he winds up losing. The funny way they pay that off though, is that when they come out of the game, Morty says immediately, oh Rick, I trust you implicitly, let's go, great. So the part of himself that he lost was the portion that didn't trust Rick, which is kind of convenient for Rick going forward and convenient for the show. I think it's their way of sort of soft rebooting the Morty character to more like a season two type of Morty as opposed to the more mistrustful version during season three. Like we're gonna clip out this one little piece of Morty's personality and he's gonna be a little bit more like he was during season two. Rick complains about not having enough pockets in his Roy form, which explains another reason why he always wears that lab coat. 
he makes a Justice League Snyder Cut joke saying 8% of it was just Batman dreaming. That was a reference to the end of the movie with the nightmare scene of that potential future that Batman was seeing in his dreams that he woke up from at the end. Which Morty claims he doesn't understand, meaning he hasn't seen the Snyder Cut. But also, that means the Snyder Cut is now canon to Rick and Morty. They just did a bunch of brand new Vindicator shorts, and the Vindicators team themselves were meant to be a big parody of all superhero movies like the Marvel Avengers movies, the DC Justice League. When the Mortys devolve into different warring factions between the ones who want to leave and the ones who want to stay, the ones that want to stay are called the Stay Publicans. And when Rick is explaining the dangers of dying inside the game, he says that he'll be okay dying in the game, but Morty would be screwed. We've actually seen what happens when Rick dies. He just reboots his consciousness in another backup body, sometimes in other realities, which they use for the plot of a previous episode. But Morty doesn't have those kinds of backup copies available to him. Rick could go pull a replacement Morty from another reality, but it wouldn't be his same Morty that he's been with the past couple seasons. Which they also just made a joke about with Jerry, like we've had the wrong Jerry for the last couple seasons. When Peter Dinklage's alien finds Rick and Morty at the Roy game, one of the aliens starts playing the actual music from Die Hard. It's Beethoven's Ode to Joy. It gets used in tons of movies and TV shows, so you've probably heard it somewhere before. They reveal eventually Marta has had a child of her own who also gets part of Morty's consciousness, and they argue about the logic of the episode with her questioning whether or not the next generation also becomes just like hers with a piece of Morty's consciousness. I think the answer is yes, because the child also speaks with Morty's voice. The way they explain the end of the episode is that Marta was the only one left inside the game, but you could always theorize that maybe somebody else is alive inside there, and it winds up being kind of like a teeny-verse, tiny-verse situation with like a whole culture rising up inside this digital game. When the alien says, the quarterback is toast, that's another line from the Die Hard movie. They both reference the end of the movie, which Summer has just learned from reading the Nakatomi Paradigm book. And then they end the episode with Rick calling out the Tower Man reference, implying that in the Tower Man version of Die Hard, in this other culture, that story ends with the exact same scenario of one of the lesser villains killing the main villain by eating him and then flying away. And then I explain what they did to Morty in this episode. Like, this is canon now. Like, he lost a piece of himself, but it was just the piece that didn't trust Rick. We'll see how they reference that during episode 3 next week. And the actual post credit scene is just a straight-up parody of the Die Hard 3 movie. Wait, why even do it? I wish my brother was still alive. In that movie, the brother of the main villain from the first movie tries to pull off another heist, and in this scene, this guy is the brother of Peter Dinklage's alien character, who then comments on how pointless it is that they're trying to pull off Die Hard 3, like it's not as good as the first movie. And in that movie, Bruce Willis is made to wear a sign just like this, which is why they make the joke about it being super racist. But if you spotted any other Easter eggs and references in the episode that I didn't spot in the video, just write them below in the comments. In my full episode 3 video, we'll post next week after they release it. Everyone click here for my House of the Dragon episode 5 trailer video, and click here for my full Rick and Morty season 6 episode 1 video. Thank you so much for watching, everyone stay safe, and I'll see you guys in the next one.